I feel like oh. we're like really crashing this amazing futurist conversation with like the horribleness of the present. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel kind of bad. <laughs> um, first of all, I mean, let's 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 give it for people who don't know you a little bit of context. Uh, can you give me your, your kind of potted history? You're now running Pando. You have a new venture. Uh, prior to that, you're a journalist, formerly of TechCrunch and, uh, and, and others. But um, talk about Pando and what that is for anyone who doesn't know. Sure, yeah. So I moved to Silicon Valley in the dot-com bubble, so about 20 years ago. Um, I managed to stay a working journalist through the crash, which was no small feat. Um, I, uh, I you know, really have always been a contrarian in Silicon Valley, and sometimes that means I'm, I believe more in the industry than other people. Um, in the rise of Web 2.0, I was one of the first people to, to really spend time with YouTube and Facebook. I first met Mark Zuckerberg when he was 19. I saw a lot of promise in the Web 2.0 wave at a time everyone was really down on the consumer internet and thought it would just never come back and never be viable businesses. And, you know, conversely, in the last couple years, I've been really one of the first people calling out the toxic bro culture and the hyper-masculinity of Silicon Valley. Um, so I'm much less popular now, but equally hated. I was hated both times. Um, but, you know, I, I wound up starting Pando. I never really, like, a lot of women in Silicon Valley, I mean, only... 3% of venture-backed companies have female CEOs. And that's not just because we get groped and harassed and belittled when we try to raise money. It's also because there's a lot of confidence uh, damaging that goes into that um, because of drawing every breath in a patriarchy. And I never expected that I would wound up starting a new company. And um, my, my good friend, Ariana Huffington, helped me out with that. I was helping build TechCrunch. And uh, a year after we sold to AOL, I was supposed to take over as the editor-in-chief. And um, I went to the hospital to have my first baby. And while I was in labor, she gave the job to someone else. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to let that hang in the air. I'm just going to let so, that hang so in the air. So I took my newborn. I didn't have a nanny. I had no family nearby. And I took my newborn. And we, we went up and down Sand Hill Road and raised $2.5 million from most of the major billionaires in Silicon Valley. First time they'd ever had a baby in the pitch meeting. And they and now you spend the rest of the time making them regret that. Decision. Yeah. Oh, they regret it every day. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about. So, so your book is is first of all, it's, it's absolutely fantastic, and I think it's out here on the twenty eighth of December. We tried um, to get you early yeah. copies. You guys would have been like the first ones ever to have them because it hasn't even come out in the U.S. yet. But there was some snafu. But please pre-order it. You can like in the this. bookshop here. Um, Early on in the book, you talk about this problem of Silicon Valley's picture of what a successful entrepreneur is, mm -hmm. is fundamentally wrong. You know, it's Steve Jobs is these belligerent, you know, assholes who, who think that that's the best way to, to, to build a business. Um, and then you talk about a lot of the data shows that actually diverse companies, women-led companies, outperform those run by, by bros, basically. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about why you think that is, that, w that they have this kind of blindness, and also why... Why, why, do, why are you having to make a business case? Because the moral <laughs> case has failed, basically, right? So you're, yeah. you're now making the business argument for, for these companies to change their ways. So the only two things that motivate business, at least in America, maybe you guys are more high-minded here, is greed or fear. And so we've, for, for four or five years, really actively been trying to make the greed case. You know, Because ultimately, uh, Silicon Valley says constantly it is a data-driven industry. All it cares about is data. If you were to talk to investors about why they would back a sociopath like Travis Kalanick, they would say, well, he's performing. All we care about is returns and data. And yet, we have, you know, primarily popularized with Lean In coming out about five years ago. There's been so much data. There's been data that proves that uh, female VCs make better investors, even though they're typically in sectors like healthcare that are lower returning overall. There's data that show that female entrepreneurs perform better on an apples to apples basis. Um, there's data that shows that gender balanced teams um, and diversity balanced teams perform better. Um, you know, there was a study out this week, the World Economic Forum said that we're actually getting worse in the gender gap and it's gonna take more than 200 years to correct at this pace. And if it even gets better by 25%, we'll add more than $5 trillion to the global economy. I mean, there is so much data. And like, 
simply put, the greed argument hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked. Inclusion has gotten worse over the time that we have shown everyone all of this data. And so a lot of what you're seeing now uh, in both Silicon Valley and Hollywood and throughout the United States is you know, really women being sick and tired of it and coming forward and realizing that they simply cannot have access to what they deserve as long as we're in a patriarchy. And that's why so many women have been coming forward and telling their stories of bad behavior and being whistleblowers because, you know, look, morality and fairness didn't work and greed and data didn't work. And so now it's about fear. You uh, you mentioned Travis Kalanick, uh, who stepped down as the CEO of Uber this year. That company's gone through an absolutely terrible time in the press, and rightly so, for mm -hmm. for their uh, for their treatment of some of their employees, and particularly women. You actually have some first-hand experience of this. Um, do you want to just tell that story and like the, the potted <laughs> uh, potted history of, the, uh, sure. of your experience with Uber? Um, so I actually I knew I've known Travis for more than 15 years. We actually used to be friends, which a lot of people don't realize, <laughs> given our bad blood now. Um, I was early on covering Uber when I was still at TechCrunch. Um, when I started Pando, we started as a publication being pretty critical of them going back to about 2012. So we were very early in this. Um, some of our earliest stories had to do with this libertarian ideology that was running the company and some ways that we thought that actually looked pretty dangerous, particularly with this idea that drivers are disposable commodities and not really human beings. Um, after that, we really started leading a lot of the reporting on um, the sexual assault that was happening in the back of Ubers. And one of the things that was the most disturbing to me is that my reporters would actually call up Uber to get comments on these things. And Uber executives would tell my reporters that the women were dressed provocatively or were drunk implying that that was fine, that they got raped in the back using this company's service. And I found that that's unimaginable on a human level. It's particularly unimaginable when you consider this is a company that was making the pitch to lawmakers that it should have barriers taken away because it was helping solve drunk driving. It's like you kind of can't have both of those in the same company. Um, it got worse and worse and worse. We all know this is like a horrible, corrupt company. I'll fill you in later if this is new to you. Um, it got worse and worse and worse, so I finally wrote a story. And they hated us, because we were the only ones going after them and pointing this stuff out. Um, and so finally, I wrote a piece, and I was just like, I'm deleting this app from my phone. It is, it is just so gross. Everything from what they would say about women getting assaulted to Travis Kalanick referring to the service as Boober because he got laid so much because of it. I mean, it was just a misogynistic company from top to bottom, and I didn't feel comfortable as a woman being in it. Even if, as they say, which has never been proven, there were fewer assaults in Ubers, I had seen how they treated women who got assaulted uh, in an Uber. So I deleted it, I wrote an article about it, and you know, it got picked up in a, a lot of places, but you know, we're obviously a, a small publication, but we're a publication that's very deeply read in Silicon Valley. And over time, we were really hurting Uber's ability to both raise money at the prices they wanted to and hire talent, which is both kind of lifeblood sure. in Silicon Valley. So they decided, they got together in what they actually called their war room and decided that I had to be silenced. And they tried a lot of other ways of trying to silence me and it hadn't really worked. So so um, the bros at Uber looked at me and said, well, what do we know about Sarah Lacey? We know she's a new mother. I bet if we attack her family, that will work. Now, this is obviously a company that's never watched a nature documentary, because if you go after a mother's young, it usually has the opposite effect, which was basically what played out. I mean, they basically went to a dinner. Ironically, this dinner was an attempt to rehabilitate Travis's reputation and make him seem like a nice guy. And at the other end of the table was Emile Michaels, who has, has finally gotten fired and is a horrible human being. And he was sitting next to Ben Smith, and he's like, here's the thing about Sarah Lacey. We're going to, we have a million dollar budget and here's the people we're gonna hire and we're gonna try to destroy her family because that's the only way that we'll ever shut her up and someone forgot to tell Ben Smith this dinner was off yeah, the record. Yeah, a BuzzFeed. Yes, I should say. and someone yes. forgot to tell him it was off the record and credit to him, table full of journalists, no one else would write the story and in fact other journalists at the dinner tried to silence him from writing the story which was the only way I found out about it. So I, I did what a mother would do. I went like full-on wings, talons, fangs for several years until everyone thought of Uber and Emile Michaels and threw up in their mouth a little bit. So, <laughs> so we, have the, 
We had the we had the, the Mayor of London talk here yesterday, and as you probably know, um, Transport for London and, and the city are currently in the process of reviewing Uber's mm -hmm. license here. It was suspended. I think they've appealed, so it's now going through the appeals process. Do you uh, have any nice messages for the for the for the people of London <laughs> and of, of how they should approach it? Because cause fundamentally, the issue uh, the, the you know the, the issue there was not reporting crime, like incidents of yeah. crime and, and not complying with regulation. It wasn't the fact. It was nothing to do with undercutting taxi drivers or any, or, or any other business right. practices. It was to do with how they process some of these some of these legal obligations. Right. Yeah, I mean, it had to do with them not following the law, which is generally the problem with Uber. I mean, there was this great naivete of let's fund people who want to break the law, and we think we'll only they'll only break certain laws. When Uber broke sexual harassment laws, trade secret theft laws, like all kinds of laws, and that's what they're doing here. So I guess the, the thing that I would point out that I feel like I spend a lot of time pointing out right now, everyone wants to believe that because Travis Kalanick is no longer the CEO, suddenly like pixie dust has been like sprinkled over the company. Company and it's a totally different place and shouldn't we give the new guy the benefit of the doubt? You know, I think the most important thing to look at is who does the CEO report to? The board. Who controls the board? Travis Kalanick. To the point where there is a lawsuit with one of their biggest investors against Travis Kalanick because they're trying to steal away control of the board for him. If that wasn't a consequential thing, there wouldn't be one of the only lawsuits of a venture firm versus a portfolio company in Silicon Valley history. As long as that CEO, no matter how amazing he may be, is still reporting to the board, which is still controlled by Travis Kalanick, there is no difference in the company when Travis Kalanick was CEO or not. Let's, we, we, we kind of go, went, went down an Uber sidetrack. Um, <laughs> you did bring it up. I, I just, totally my own fault, it's totally my own fault. It's the cliff notes. Um, we've seen this problem be, it is endemic. You know, the last couple of weeks in particular, since, since the uh, Harvey Weinstein um, stuff has come out in, in Hollywood, we saw early this year with the Google memo that, that companies are really struggling with this. Um, some of the companies, you know, to Google, to their, to their credit, I think you, you write in the book, have been historically pretty good at this, partly because they have uh, the Wojcicki sisters um, uh, very early on in the company. Um, Facebook has Sheryl Sandberg as, as the COO. What companies are dealing with this, what, you, know, you, you call it bro, comp bro, uh, bro culture, this rampant misogyny, what companies are doing this well and what are you kind of advocating that they need to do to change this kind of culture internally? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's two really simple things you can do. One is you need to have diversity and inclusion from day one. I mean, there's so much studies showing that if you have racially diverse and gender diverse teams from day one, your teams continue to go in those directions and have that same percentage. It can't be something you put off later. And so if I were a VC today, which I never will be, but if I were a VC, I would be saying, you know, my requirement for you as you have a couple people in the room is we need to see 40% diversity now because it will simply be that way and it will scale. And again, endless data to show the company will do better if you do that. I think the other thing is um, to eliminate this expectation that you have to work every night until 3 a.m. I mean, that is one thing that keeps a lot of people who want to be engaged parents, whether mothers or fathers, out of the startup ecosystem. And beyond that, it's bullshit. I mean, it is just bullshit. Speaking of data, there are so many studies that show people are not capable of focusing 18 hours a day every sure. single day for years on end. The quality of the work degrades. And there's also studies that show that um, even when people say that they you know, work 80 hours a week, when they've actually been asked to log their hours, they work nothing like 80 hours a week. And if you've ever been in a startup in Silicon Valley, probably here as well, <clears throat> you see how much time is wasted. I mean, one of the things that makes mothers such an, such an amazing economic force is there's studies that showing that after having kids, you become so much more productive and you become productive for the rest of your career and multiple children make you that much more productive. And that's who you should want at your company, not some douchey kid who's like playing foosball for half the day. <laughs> so until there's... <laughs> So like, until we get over this silly idea that people have to be at the office at 3 a.m., you know, women are going to continually be weeded out of the workforce unfairly, and for that matter, men. Men who want to be home to see their children in the afternoon for a few hours. And look, I'm right now a single mom. I have two children. I have no nanny. I have no family nearby. 
I still work 11 hours a day. I drop my kids off at school, I pick them up. There's a lot of hours in the day. It's really about flexibility and this rigidity of this macho mindset that you have to be this young white kid out of Stanford, otherwise we're not interested, when every data will show, yeah, maybe those guys have made you the most money, but because that's all your funding, they've also lost all your money. You are, you are kind of taking this now into a movement uh, you've now, you've, I mean, the book comes out in a few weeks' time. You've got a podcast. You've also got a new company coming up, Chairman Mom. Do you want to quickly plug that? Yeah, yeah, I would love to. So um, we, everything is just like, everything I've done around this topic has just exploded and exploded and exploded. And um, what I, what I, what I discovered in the process of working on this book and all the social science that I looked at is the most insidious weapon that the patriarchy has is basically implanted in our brains. It's this feeling of isolation and guilt, particularly that professional working moms have. At the office, we have to project that we have it all, even if there's other women who might be able to relate. Maternal bias is the most overt form of bias women face in the workplace, so you have to constantly project you've got it together. Women are very isolated at work. Women are isolated um, in society. 40% of Americans think it's bad for society if women work. So you're actually just made to feel like shit for living your life as you would have not having produced a human being. Um, you're isolated in your marriage because if a woman makes a, even a dollar more than her husband, the odds of his infidelity go way up. And in fact, the more economically dependent a man is on a woman, the odds of his infidelity go up even more. So working professional moms are the most isolated people and that's increasingly where our country is going. I mean, 40% of households in America are breadwinner moms. The rise of single moms is way up because a lot of men are not making marriage look good. So um, I think if you can really combat that isolation and give women a space that is troll-free, where there's very smart anonymity tools, which is abuse-free and mommy war-free, to hash out and talk about the hardest issues they face and most of all just let them know they're doing fine and everyone's facing the same shit and all the stuff the patriarchy is putting in their head are lies i think you fundamentally change the country and that's what we're building with chairman mom and if you thought that was good check out sarah's book and check out the extract <laughs> in the next issue wide that's all we have time for sarah thanks so much for joining us thank you <laughs>